couple announcements um, while people are still filtering in. Homework two is due tonight. Hopefully you already knew that. Project two, Drew, due tomorrow night. There are the announcements. No. Project two, <laughs> a week from Friday. Very sorry for any rising panic that occurred in any of you. Uh, it was unintentional. Uh, I misread off of my phone. Project two, a week from tomorrow. Thank you. Okay, let's get started. Um, for those of you who had time to look at these two quiz questions um, while you're sitting here, um, this is just reviewing some of what we went over last time. So, first one. Oh, I was going to use the laser pointer. It's gone. Okay. I'll use my cursor. Um, propositional logic, any logic defines what's true or false given a model or a, uh, given a model and a sentence. Here's a model and a sentence. Is it true or false in propositional logic? Um, raise your hand if you, did if you did have time to work this out and get to an answer. That's not that many of you. OK. Uh, well, what answer did you get? True. That's right. We replace all the symbols, uh, we will replace all the values with the, sorry, all the variables with the values that they get in the model. Um, false or false is false. True or true, sorry, not true or true is false. True if and only if, true is true. False implies false, that's true. Because false implies anything is true. Because you can't contradict it by finding a case where the, uh, premise is true and the conclusion is false. So false, and fa false implies false is true. You can look back at definitions for that. True and true, that's true. This one over here, do the following sentences entail H? Raise your hand, put a one up if you think yes, put a two up if you think no. Can you derive H from these sentences? A single symbol on its own is basically saying that symbol's true. So it's a sentence, a short sentence, but it's a sentence. All those ones at the beginning. This is the and sign, if you forgot. If you forgot which is and and or, that's and. Upside down is or. OK, one for. Yes, two for no. Is it entailed? Go. Does nobody know? All right. So if we have A and we have A implies B, then B is going to be entailed. Any possible world in which the first two sentences are true, the latter sentence is going to have to be true as well. That's what, uh, that's what implication accomplishes. It's if we have all the things on the left-hand side of the implication, the premises, then we can conclude what's on the right. Um, I think you guys covered propositional logic and prerequisites for this course. Um, so this should all be familiar to you. Um, so let's look at this one. Are A and E true? Or are A and E, uh, do we have A and E in this list of possible sentences? Who says yes? Who says no? OK, I need more than this, guys. Is A in here? Who says yes? 
Yeah, there it is. You can read it. Who says no? Right. What about E? Is E in there? Yes? E is not listed as one of these symbols, so we don't, the, the, this knowledge base doesn't say that E is true. Uh, maybe we could derive it, but, um, oops, sorry. Maybe we could derive it, but it's not listed here yet. Um, so we can't yet imply H from here. But if you look down here, we have F and G, so we can conclude E. There's F, there's G. Oops, sorry, there's F, there's G. We could also con conclude D, by the way, but it's not going to help us. We, ca we have F and G, so we can conclude E. Then we have A and E, so we can conclude H. So H is entailed. OK. I'm going to hope that you guys are just uh, a bit lethargic rather than uh, did, uh, raise your hand if, if this is like, if, if you need me to go over this stuff again. OK, let's do that. Um, so uh, let's see. Well, we're going to go over the forward chaining algorithm anyway. Um, so you can see how that works, uh, and then maybe we can go back to some of the definitions. Yeah. Yes, the commas are not in the logic. They are separating different logical sentences. That is helpful, thanks, yeah. Okay, another good question. So the commas um, separate how many sentences? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 sentences. So this is, the knowledge base is a set of sentences delimited by commas. Um, uh, right, so this is, it's not three sentences. Um, and um, so the, yeah, the knowledge base is, the, is that set of sentences. Also helpful, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I could have put curly brackets around this whole thing to indicate that this is a set of sentences. Anyone uh, want a reminder of what implies means? OK. Let's get to the forward chaining algorithm. We can always stop for questions again after that. So uh, first, and this is a reminder from last time, um, our two methods for doing in inference will be checking models for every possible world. If alpha is true, make sure that beta is true too. That's how we check whether the alpha entails beta. Second method is theorem proving. Search for a sequence of proof steps, application of inference rules. I haven't told you about either of those things yet, but we'll see an example. Leading from alpha to beta. And a sound algorithm, an algorithm for discovering whether beta is entailed by alpha, is everything that it claims to prove is in fact entailed, and a complete algorithm, everything that is entailed, can be proved. Okay, here's our forward chaining algorithm that I introduced you to, the end, introduced you to at the end of last class. It applies modus ponens, this is this, this is this rule. If you have x1 through xn in your knowledge base, and you have this uh, it's what's called a definite clause in your knowledge base, x1 and x2 and so on to xn implies y, then we can infer y. So that's what implies intuitively means. If the things on the left are true, that means the things on the right are true. The things on the left are true, so the thing on the right is true. Forward chaining keeps applying that rule uh, as much as we can. And as I mentioned to you last time, it requires the knowledge base to only contain definite clauses. So a conjunction, that means lots of ands, a conjunction of symbols implies another symbol. Um, or the knowledge base al also contains single symbols, like I showed you on the, on the introductory slide. 
um, which is actually equivalent to saying true implies x, because if you have true on the left-hand side of the implies, well then, yeah, everything on the left is satisfied, so that means everything on the right is satisfied. So x is equivalent to true implies x. So really, everything is of this form, but sometimes you see it like this, and so it's not obvious that it's of that form. And uh, yeah, we saw some tricks last time, and I'll, and I'll go into the, how that works. So here's, here are our definite clauses. We have them separated by commas, maybe. We just have some set of them. And they're in our knowledge base. And we have, there's some query Q. And we want to see if it's entailed. So we keep track of how many symbols are in the premise, that's the left-hand side, of each clause. Each clause is one of these sentences in our knowledge base. Um, it says, we say a clause rather than a sentence because you could imagine it being like uh, sentence one and sentence two and sentence three and sentence four. That's all one big sentence, each component. It, it's nice to call it something else than a sentence, so we call it a clause. We keep track of whether we have inferred the symbol already in the course of running this algorithm. And that means we've, we've deduced that it's true. And we keep track of a queue of symbols. And what's going to be in this agenda is um, symbols we've, we've deduced that they're true, but we haven't yet tried to run it forward to see what other implications, uh, what other conclusions we can draw using our implications. So what we initially put in the agenda are the symbols we know to be true. So in this example, we'd put a, C, D, F, and G into our agenda um, because we're going to need to run through the consequences of those symbols. And then as long as we have things in the agenda, we need to keep going. We take a symbol out of our agenda, the first one, I guess. We check to see if that symbol is the thing we're trying to prove. If it's the thing we're trying to prove, then we're done. Otherwise, we check to see if we've already tried to run it through uh, to, to draw conclusions from it. If we've already, um, if inferred is true, if we've already done this, then we skip the rest because we've already, we've already kind of carried it forward. But if we haven't yet inferred it, if this is the first time we're noticing that the symbol's true, we set, it, we set inferred to true. And now for each clause in the knowledge base where it's in the premise, now we have one fewer symbol in the premise that we need to show. So we decrement the count, and if the count ever gets to zero, we add the conclusion to our agenda. These are new things that we've learned, that, uh, new things that we've deduced that we, uh, that we can carry forward, that we can chain forward. So here's an example of running the forward chaining algorithm. Here are our sentences, A, B, D, A and B implies C, C and D implies E. And we want to know whether this knowledge base entails whether we can deduce from this F. Now, spoiler alert, of course not. F doesn't appear anywhere in here. How could we possibly deduce F from these sentences? But I'll run you through the algorithm to show you how it works. I'll pause for questions first. OK. I'll show you this, and then I'll pause for questions again. So we start with the inferred array initialized to false for everything. So we haven't yet inferred any of these. But we have on our agenda A, B, and D, because these are the, these are the symbols that we've established as true in our knowledge base. So these are on our agenda. We're keeping track of how many symbols there are in the premise of each of these clauses. The premise is the left-hand side, so it's two for each of them. And now we remove, we're remove. we going to remove, let's say, A, the first one, from the agenda. We check to see if it's our query. No, it's not. We remove it from the agenda. Now we set inferred to be true. Now we've inferred A. And we look for A over here. There it is. It could be in multiple places, but it's here. So we decrement the count associated with this. Now we have one symbol left in the premise that we're going to need to show before we could, could conclude the conclusion. And we still have two symbols left that we're going to need to um, 
that we're going to need to prove before we can conclude the conclusion of this. So we're getting there for this one. OK, next up, b. We'll remove b from the agenda, set the inferred value equal to true. Uh, because it's newly set to true, it wasn't true already, um, and this happened in the last step too, we look for b over here. Here it is. It's one of the premises in here. So we decrement the count of premises left to uh, check for here, and we get to 0. So we've uh, inferred all of the symbols in the premise of this sentence, so we can conclude the conclusion. So we add it to our agenda. There it is. C gets added to the agenda. Um, any questions up to this point? C is added. What do you mean it's not added? It's added. It, oh, right. It's not added at the very beginning because it's, yeah, because it's not on its own. You have to do some work to discover that C is one of the things you know. Um, I mean, if these were the different symbols, you might, never, you might never satisfy the premise, and so you might never infer C. So it takes some work before you can discover, before you can verify for yourself that C is, yeah, a symbol. Yeah. A more accurate word, a more accurate label for this might be inferred yet. Yeah, that would be a more accurate. It's, it's, yeah, it's not like will you ever infer it, not can you infer it, but have you already in the course of the algorithm inferred it? And so even, I mean, maybe it seems a bit silly, but even these things where we've put them on the agenda, we don't say we've inferred them yet. You could. It would just be an extra line of code, and you don't need it because you'd still need the line of code that adds it to the inferred thing, and so, yeah. Oh. Uh-huh. That's right. That's right. We set inferred to true because we took it off the agenda. Yep. Yeah. Uh, it will be, we, it just hasn't been inferred yet. So this is what I was saying before, we could, you could add in a step where everything that, actually you couldn't, it would mess up some of the logic because you need to, um, it's on the agenda, it will get inferred. We just, we just haven't inferred it yet. Um, so you actually can't put it on, you can't say start out with it inferred because you do this business of reducing the, counts of symbols and premises um, that are remaining to show only when you first infer a symbol. So not only, um, uh, not only is it like if it's inferred, you, you kind of check it off on the right over there. It's when you first infer it, you check it off on the right. So we start out by saying it hasn't been inferred yet, even though any idiot could see that it's going to be. Um, and then when we finally do take it off the agenda, then we'll set inferred to true. So this is just inferred yet, and we've, we're, we're getting our way, we're, we're going through it kind of slowly. I mean, you're, when you're looking at it, you can skip ahead easily, but uh, yeah, we haven't gotten there yet. Okay, next up, we'll take the first thing off the agenda. Now it's C, so we remove it for the agenda. We set inferred to true. Yep. And C is one of the symbols in the premise over here. So we decrement the count associated with that uh, clause or sentence. And next up, D is in our agenda. So we remove it uh, from the agenda, set inferred to true, decrement the count there, and now we'll add E to the agenda because the count's gotten to zero. So all the symbols in here have been inferred, so we can conclude the conclusion. That is E. So now we add it to the agenda. Next, we take E off the agenda. Inferred is true. And E isn't a premise anywhere, so nothing happens over here. 
Um, now our agenda's empty, so we're done. The algorithm terminates when the agenda's empty. Have we ever concluded F? No, of course not. We were never going to, but this is how the algorithm behaves on this problem. Um, if our query had been E, then this would be the step where we would output true, because we've just inferred E. OK, uh, maybe we handled all the questions earlier, but if there are any more about this algorithm, uh, go ahead. Mm. Yes? Yeah. If you used a different data structure, it might go on the end, and you'd get to it at the end. Um, the, I don't think it's important what kind of data structure you use for the agenda. Maybe some are better than others. I haven't thought that through. Yeah? Is it similar to a topological sort? I don't know topological sort. Can you describe it to me? Sounds very similar, yeah. Um, yeah, could be equivalent. Yeah, no problem. OK. Um, is there more review you guys want re related to some of the confusion about the quiz questions? And if so, what? Uh, if so, on what? I have to see at least one all good. Yeah? Minimax, that's in the last um, that's in the last topic. So if you're confused about that, um, you'll definitely want to resolve that at some point, but it won't it, it I just mean this this bit of logic. Um, so it, it won't trouble you for the rest of this section, and, and maybe you can ask your TA, or you can come up at the end uh, and ask about that. Anything else from the logic lecture last time that I should go over again? Yeah. So if you had no trace in the VA to start, mm -hmm. could you not say the same thing about the other questions in this section? Like, if you didn't have any start in the trace? That's right. If all three of these were gone, um, you, the agenda would be empty right from the beginning, and you'd halt. So, yeah, you'd, you'd, this would be a pretty quick algorithm. Yeah? Would it work for, like, say, for questions in the project not E, if you say, if, if people were not working on the paper, or, like, if, if the quiz was not just like your intentional code of getting E out of E? That's exactly right. Yeah, it doesn't. There's, it's, a, it's a limited, so the question was, would it work if there were nots in here? And no, it would not, for exactly the reason um, you described, which is the, the, whole, the count system wouldn't really work correctly. Um, so this only works for uh, so-called definite clauses, where you have a conjunction, that is ands, of symbols on the left. They're all in positive form, they're not negated, um, and you have one symbol on the right. You could probably do something very similar if you had a conjunction of symbols on the right. Yeah, you could. OK. So properties of forward chaining. Theorem, it's sound and complete. Awesome. That's what we want from an inference algorithm. Four definite clause knowledge bases. So they have to be in this very precise form. Uh, it is, in fact, quite limiting. You can't express an arbitrary uh, sentence in this definite clause form. But if you get lucky and you have a knowledge base of this form, then here's how you can prove things quickly. So the soundness follows from modus ponens, easy to check. Um, you're never going to uh, add something to, a, to the agenda um, that can't be entailed uh, by by what you've got so far, because that's what implies does, is it, is it guarantees that, that this works. Completeness, uh, there's a few things we need to, to talk about to verify. Everything that can be entailed will be entailed by this. Every symbol that can be entailed will be entailed by this algorithm. Here's how we show that. 
First, we need to show that the algorithm terminates. How do we know it terminates? The number of times we go through this loop cannot exceed the number of sentences we have. The number, the number of times we go through this loop is equal to the number of symbols that will ever be on the agenda. What can add symbols to the agenda? Well, symbols can be added to the agenda if they start there. So there's one of our sentences. Or a symbol can be added. This can add a symbol to the agenda once. If the count gets to zero, it can add this symbol. This, can add a, this sentence can add a symbol to the agenda once if the count gets to zero. Every sentence, including these isolated symbols, can add up to one symbol to the agenda. So the, so the number of symbols that ever appear in the agenda is less than or equal to the number of sentences that we start with. That's finite. So the number of symbols that ever appear on the, gen on the agenda is finite. And so we run this through a finite number of times. OK, so we get to a fixed point. Yep. Mm -hmm. Then this wouldn't be in, um, this wouldn't be a definite clause. It's not the right form for this algorithm. Yeah. Um, so the algorithm will stop at some point. And then there will be a set of known to be true symbols in this uh, inferred thing. So here's our known to be true symbols. And here, when we've stopped, here is our set of known to be true symbols, A, B, C, D, and E. So consider that final set of known to be true symbols. And now consider a model which says those symbols are all true, all take a value of true, and all the other symbols, all the other variables take a value of false. There's our model. Let's think about that model. Every clause in the original knowledge base is true in that model. Let's check this. Proof. Suppose otherwise. Suppose that a clause, A1 and A2 and so on, implies B, is false in the model, but it is in our knowledge base. Then, if that's false, that means this is true. Sorry, that means this is false, even though that's true. So B is false, and all these are true in the model, according to the model. Therefore, the algorithm has not reached a fixed point. Why? Because if this is in the model, and this is not, then these are all known to be true symbols, and this is not. If these are all known to be true symbols, then uh, the last of them would have been inferred at one point, and at that point in time, we could have concluded B. This would, if all of these were known to be true, then we would have added this in. But we didn't. By hypothesis, B is false in the model, so it wasn't one of the known to be true symbols. So this is a contradiction. We, we derive from this, the algorithm has not reached a fixed point, despite having shown before that it does. Therefore, M is a model of the knowledge base. So we got to this contradiction by assuming the opposite, right there. So M is a model of the knowledge base. And therefore, well, by the definition of entailment, if a knowledge base entails a query, then Q is true in every model of the knowledge base if Q is true in every model of the knowledge base and M is a model of the knowledge base, then Q is true in M. If Q is true in M, then it's in this final set, <coughs> excuse me, it's in this final set of known to be true symbols. If it's in the final set of known to be true symbols, it's returned by the algorithm. So there's a proof, um, uh, and um, I don't, I, it, it's okay if you didn't follow every single one of those steps. Um, we're going to have to move on from here. Um, but, th but there's a proof that uh, any sentence that can be entailed will be returned by this algorithm. Um, I'll take a couple questions on this um, if you guys have them. Okay. 
So that's called forward chaining. Um, that implies there's another algorithm called backward chaining. Um, and this is a puzzle for you guys to try at home if you're interested in this. Um, try to develop a backward chaining algorithm and then look it up to see if you've reproduced the, the standard one. The idea here is you keep track of what you're trying to prove and you look for sentences that might get you there. So here, you could see immediately, where'd my cursor go? There. You could see immediately that we were never going to prove f because f isn't the conclusion of any of these sentences. How could we ever get there? So the backward chaining al algorithm should start by looking for sentences that prove f and then going from there. And so the backward chaining algorithm would be even faster and it would, uh, and it would write from the beginning notice that you're not going to prove f. So you can think about how to, um, how to work through the details of that if you're interested in it. Or you could go to the textbook or you could just look it up. But there is another algorithm and it can be much faster. Okay. Um, next up, we're going to talk about a different algorithm for determining entailment, determining whether um, a knowledge base or a giant sentence alpha entails uh, some other sentence beta. And uh, we'll have to talk about uh, a couple concepts first. Um, so I'll introduce those concepts. Satisfiability, how does that relate to entailment? So a sentence is satisfiable if it is true in at least one possible world, if there's some assignment of values to variables that makes the sentence true. So is the sentence A and B satisfiable? Sure. You set A to be true, you set B to be true. Is the sentence A or B satisfiable? Yeah, even easier. You set A to be true and B to be false, for instance. Uh, is the sentence A and not A true? Uh, no, because if you set A to be true, then it doesn't work. And if you set A to be false, it doesn't work. There's no way to assign values to the variables in order to make it true. So the sentence A and not A is unsatisfiable. Questions about satisfiability? Now, those examples were all very easy to check, but if you have a long sentence, it can be really hard. NP complete, in fact. So suppose we have a hyper-efficient SAT solver, that is something that takes a sentence uh, and determines whether there is an assignment of values to variables that makes the whole thing true. How can we use it to attest entailment? Uh, and yeah, unfortunately, there is going to be, there is, unless P equals NP, there's going to be no uh, algorithm that is fast in every case. So here's how we can use such an algorithm to test entailment. So we want to know if alpha entails beta. Now this is true. Alpha does entail beta if and only if alpha implies beta is true in all possible worlds. This is another way of seeing the connection between entailment and implication. So if alpha, if, if the set of possible worlds where alpha is true is a subset of the possible worlds where beta is true, then in every possible world, alpha implies beta is going to be true. Alpha implies beta is true in all possible worlds if not alpha implies beta is false in all possible worlds. Rewrite that as alpha and not beta is false in all possible worlds. That is, it's unsatisfiable. So we add the negated conclusion to our knowledge base. So we have our knowledge base alpha or our lo big long sentence alpha. We add not beta to it and we see if that whole thing is unsatisfiable. So this is also reductio ad absurdum. This is proof by contradiction. We, we assume the opposite of what we're trying to prove um, and we check to see whether we reach a contradiction. Now, efficient SAT solvers operate on a particular form of sentence called conjunctive normal form. So I'll tell you how to turn any sentence in propositional logic into conjunctive normal form. And then we can get to efficient SAT solvers. Yeah. Warning NP complete means. Well, I'll tell you what NP hard means first. No, 
First, I'll tell you what NP means. NP is a kind of problem where you can determine, the, you can check an answer in polynomial time. Um, you can check whether an answer is an answer to that question in polynomial time. Some of those problems, we think, are very hard. Um, a, a problem is NP hard if a solution to that problem would allow you to solve any problem in NP. So this is, a, this is getting into complexity theory. Um, and so if we had um, a SAT solver that ran in polynomial time, then that would mean any problem where you could check the solution in, prob in polynomial time, you could transform that problem into a SAT problem, use your polynomial time algorithm to get a solution, convert the solution back into um, a solution to your original problem, all in pol polynomial time. So if we had a polynomial time algorithm for solving the SAT problem, then we could have a polynomial time algorithm for solving any problem where you can check the answer in polynomial time. We could discuss more about complexity theory uh, after. Yeah. Uh, not again. I haven't told you. There. Uh, yeah, so you are forgiven for not knowing. Um, conjunctive normal form is as follows. A sentence is in conjunctive normal form. If it is a conjunction of clauses, conjunction means lots of ands, what's a clause? A clause is a disjunction of literals. Disjunction means lots of ors. What's a literal? A literal is either a symbol or a negated symbol. So here is an example of a sentence in conjunctive normal form. We have lots of ands on the outside, this and that and that and that and that. And in each one, we have some ors, or maybe none. A or not B or not C. Um, and then the nots are at the lowest level. And luckily, we can convert any sentence uh, written in propositional logic into conjunctive normal form with standard transformations. So for example, this sentence, uh, Pac-Man being at location 1-1 one, one at time 0, implies that uh, there's a wall at 0-1 if and only if Pac-Man is blocked to the west at time 0. That's the sentence. We want to convert it to conjunctive normal form. First thing we do is we replace this biconditional with two implications. I'll give you a more general system uh, after this example. Um, so we, we replace A if and only if B with A implies B and B implies A. Then we replace implications. We replace not, sorry, we replace alpha implies beta with not alpha or beta. That's the definition of implication. <coughs> we do that in all three spots. We get this. And then we distribute, and I'll tell you more about this in the next slide, we distribute ors over ands. So this is similar to distributing multiplication over a sum. Um, so we can distribute it. We can just, this or is on the outside, the and is on the inside, but we want the and on the outside and the or on the inside. So we can distribute it like this. OK, how does distributivity work? If we have a or b and c, that is equivalent to a and c or b and c. Uh, you can try to work this out in your head, but you'll probably have better luck with an example. I'm in SF, or I'm in Berkeley, and I'm alive. That sentence is the same as I'm in SF and alive, or I'm in Berkeley and alive. Any doubts? <laughs> okay, great. Those two things are the same. Works the same way if you switch the and and or. I won't give you another example. Uh, same kind of deal. A and B or C is A or C and B or C. You can also distribute knots. 
because we want the knots at the lowest level. Not A and B is equivalent to not A or not B. Here's an example. It's not the case that I'm alive and kicking is equivalent to saying I'm not alive or I'm not kicking. One of these things has to be false for this whole thing to be false. OK. And likewise for or, you flip the or to an and, you move the not inside. So then, reducing to conjunctive normal form, we want something that looks like this. So we get rid of the uh, biconditional. We replace that with two implications. And these alpha and beta, they can be big, long expressions. They can be, there can be parentheses with a whole lot of stuff inside. Um, they don't have to just be symbols. Uh, we get rid of the implications like that. I'm going to go through this quickly because um, you can look it up. Uh, you distribute the knots to lower levels, uh, and if there are any ors at a higher level than ands, then you distribute them down. So you can replace alpha and beta and gamma, or epsilon and delta with, OK, this one I'm going to ask you to try and think about, about uh, how we do this. And I'll give you a minute, and then I'll ask for hands. How do we distribute that? I only gave you an example of two on one side and one on the other, so this is generalizing a bit. OK, any ideas? Any guesses about what this will have to look like? You can try to think about. Imagine that this is a, because uh, you know the the way distributivity worked in the last slide, it it was just the same as multiplication and addition. So you could imagine this is multiplication, that's addition. Yeah. It's it I you're you're getting there, I think. Yes, that's right. I'm pretty sure that's right. Um, I went and went one step further and distributed kind of in both directions. So you can do this step by step. You can just treat epsilon and delta as one thing. Just imagine it as a single symbol in your head and distribute over one side of them. Um, and that was what that, that answer suggested. Um, then in the next step, you do it over the other side. Uh, I've just done, gone in one step, done every possible pair. So it's six of them. There's three on the left, there's two on the right. You do alpha or epsilon and beta or epsilon and gamma or epsilon, so on with the, with the deltas. Uh, so you can see this can get a little ugly. It can, get, it can blow up. Yeah. Higher level. So remember the algorithm that was the, like, uh, recursive, um, is like recursive evaluation. So you look at the highest level symbol. So the highest level symbol, what I mean by that is the thing that operates last. Um, so this is the highest level symbol here. You could say it's a at a higher level. Higher level, I, I don't think that's standard terminology. Um, it's just the, it's the highest level. I don't know what else to call it. Yeah, these are lower, le lower level. So you want the ors to be low level and the ands to be higher level. OK, that's conjunctive normal form. And now, before we get to an efficient um, SAT solver, let's talk about an inefficient one. OK, so here's conjunctive normal form at the top. Here are our clauses. It's a conjunction of clauses, ands connecting them. <coughs> and here is just a depth first search solver. And there are going to be some tricks I'll talk about later that go here. But we'll skip those for now. So we have our clauses. So this would be a, a set that's like alpha or beta, sorry, A or B, and A or not C or D. Or, uh, sorry, and so our third clause is C or not B. Our fourth clause is just B. Then we have our symbols, A, B, C, D. And then we have a partial model. 
And the first time we call this, the partial model is going to be empty. So a partial model is an assignment of values to some variables. A whole model is an assignment of values to all variables, but we're going to be dealing with partial models that we kind of construct over the course of this algorithm. So the way this depth first search solver works, if every clause is true, then we've satisfied the whole sentence because the sentence is just ands connecting them. So if every one is true in the partial model, then we return true. If any of them are false, then we return false. Now, some of them won't be true or false. They won't have been decided yet because it's a partial model. We haven't assigned values to every variable. So if we have, you know, if we've assigned A to be true, but we haven't assigned values to any of the other variables, none of these... Uh, this will be true, because you only need one thing to be true for the whole thing to be true. This will be true, same reason, but this won't be true or false. This won't be true or false because we haven't assigned values to these variables. So a clause can become true even when only some of the variables within it have been assigned values because it's an or, it's, 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 an, it's connected by ors, it's a disjunction. Uh, so any of the things being true makes the whole thing true. Uh, but if we've assigned some falses in there, or if there are, you know, if we haven't assigned anything to be true yet, and there are some missing uh, variables that we haven't assigned a value to, then the clause won't be true or false. So maybe we'll get to uh, terminate even with a partial model, and maybe we'll have to fill out a whole model before we get to one of these things. Um, but if we don't terminate, we go down here. We pick a symbol somehow, and we try setting it to be true, and continue from there. And then we try setting it to false and continue from there. And then we recursively call this. Our partial model has been built up a bit. There's more assignments of values to variables. Eventually, we'll assign a value to every variable. And once every variable has been assigned a value, then every clause has to be true or false. So we'll terminate. Any questions? Before we get to the tricks, we have to understand this bit. Yeah. The nodes would be partial models. Um, so we start with no assignments of values to variables. As we descend, like here, when we're splitting in two, we're either assigning uh, a variable to be true or to be false. Uh, and so when we get to a particular node, we've assigned some values to variables. Uh, and so, yeah, the node is saying which values ha uh, have been assigned to variables. And the edges. I mean, in a tree, the, the edge leading into a node has all the same information as the node itself, so it's kind of the same thing. Yeah? Yep, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So this will return true if the sentence has, uh, if there exists a model that satisfies the sentence, and it will return false if it doesn't, because it'll look through them all. And if it ever works, then it'll return true. Yep. Partial model, an assignment of some, an assignment of values to some variables. In the, um, in the notes, uh, this is written as model, and I find that confusing because it doesn't assign values to all the variables. So easier to think of it, I think, as a partial model. Um, OK, let's talk about tricks that make it go faster so we don't have to look through everything. So efficient SAT solvers <coughs> are mostly structured around, um, uh, are mostly variants of this Davis Putnam Logman Loveland algorithm, DPLL. That's the core. Uh, it's recursive depth first search, like I just showed you over partial models, but with some extras. So uh, actually, early termination I already showed you. Um, if, any, if all the clauses are satisfied, um, then we return true. If any of them are falsified, then we return false. So here's a partial model. A is true. B and C are who knows. But this clause is satisfied, because you only need to satisfy one of the things for the or to return true. This is satisfied, same reason. So every clause is satisfied. This one, uh, there's a clause that is 
falsified. If A is false and B is false, A or B is false. This one might end up true if we get, if we get the right value for C, but who cares? We've already determined that one of the clauses is false. If one of the clauses is false, then the whole thing is false. So that's a partial model that would also lead to early termination. These are clauses, just as a reminder. OK, first new trick, pure literals. If all occurrences of a symbol in clauses, is, in clauses that are not yet satisfied have the same sign, then we give the symbol the right value. So A is positive in every clause. So we might as well put it to true. It's never going to hurt. Um, there's no instance of not A that maybe we were counting on being the thing that made that clause work. Um, if A is al always in positive form, we might as well set it to true. We don't need to like, try, oh, what happens if A is true? What happens if A is false? We don't need a branch like that. We can just go straight down. Second trick, unit clauses. If one clause has one unresolved literal, then we can set that, well, then we'd better set it to make sure that clause is satisfied. It's our last hope for getting that clause to be satisfied. So we'd better set it in the right way. So for example, here are our partial model so far says that A is false, B and C, we haven't decided on them yet. So this sentence, we substitute false in for A. It looks like this. So now this is a unit clause. It has one unresolved literal, B. So we'd better set it to be true or else this clause is going to fail. And often satisfying the unit clause will lead to further unit clauses um, or maybe new. Will it ever lead to a pure literal? Probably. Yeah. OK, so here's the algorithm that, that implements that. I've uncovered these few lines. The first thing we do, <coughs> um, we, only keep, we only need to keep track of the clauses that we haven't already shown are true. So some clauses, I mean, if any clauses are false, we've terminated and returned false. Um, so this is never really going to happen. But um, if a clause if there are some clauses that are true, we can get rid of them and never think about them again. So we, we only keep the clauses that have not yet been shown to be true and also obviously have not yet been shown to be false. And now we, we find pure symbols. We use some algorithm uh, to find any symbols where they always appear in the positive form or they always appear in the negative form. And we output that symbol and that value if it exists. So if p is non-null, we've succeeded at that. Uh, and so now we add um, p with that value to our partial model. We remove p from the symbols. We recursively call it. So we've gone down. We've, we've added to our partial model, but we've only added one function call. So that's much better than adding two function calls. That'll be much quicker. Likewise, we, we uh, call some function that, looks, that checks for unit clauses. Is there a clause where there's only one uh, symbol left that is not yet resolved? If so, we'd better resolve it in the way that makes the clause true. So then we, uh, we, we get p and the value that it's supposed to take if p, if, yeah. Or it return a null value if there is no unit clause. So if p is non-null, then again, we set it the right way and, and keep going. Otherwise, too bad, we have, to, we have to bifurcate, we have to try two possibilities, one where p is true and one where p is false. And, uh, oops, I forgot to use the like highlighting bits. And, and recall, I mentioned this in the last slide, a clause is, is one unresolved literal, not just one literal. Okay, um, here is the attendance code. You can take a little longer to look at this while you're doing that. And then um, we'll go through an example of running through this algorithm. <coughs> yeah.
Yeah, you need to do, it's not trivial, but you can do it in constant time. So um, you, okay, for the pure symbols part, you can just keep track of all the clauses where it appears in the positive form and where it appears in the negative form. Um, when clauses are satisfied, you cross them off that list so you can have pointers that take you straight there. Um, I think that's probably enough to do it in constant time. For finding unit clauses, um, I guess you can have a variable with, for each clause, basically like a count, um, like in the forward chaining algorithm. And every time you, uh, mm, yeah, so you, you, need to, you need to, every time you assign a variable a value, you also need pointers to every clause where it appears so that you can decrement the count of unresolved literals in that clause so that you can um, kind of automatically see when one gets to one. Um, you don't have to search for it every time. Um, I'd have to think about it more. Either yes, you have to do that, or maybe there's some other trick uh, to to get you straight to the right one. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, what was the second bit? No, 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 no. If, uh, that's why we've written the rest of the algorithm. We might not, it, it, we might pass by both of these first two lines in any given run. When we'll definitely hit either of the two first lines is when the partial model is a full model. If the partial model is a full model, every clause is either going to be true or false. So at the very, so it will terminate, but not immediately necessarily. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. This last bit. So if none of the tricks worked, then we just have to take a guess. OK, maybe let's try A being true. And then if, and then if that doesn't work, we'll try A being false. So that's what this does. Um, we pick a symbol, let's say A. Uh, we set it to be true. And we try running the algorithm again from that point. Um, and if that doesn't work, then we try, uh, well, yeah, if it doesn't return true, then we try. Um, setting it to A equals false. Yeah, we're going to have, yeah. If it didn't work for either one, then, um, then it's false. I mean, if, there was no, if it returned false both times, false or false is false. So in, at a lower recursive depth, we will be choosing other symbols. Yeah. More questions? Let's get to an example. Um, maybe more questions will arise, or maybe some will be answered. OK, here's our starting sentence in conjunctive normal form, a conjunction of disjunction of, li of disjunctions of literals. So first pass through the algorithm. There are no pure symbols or unit clauses. Uh, you can verify this. So we try setting A to be true. And we try setting A to be false. And we proceed kind of, we'll proceed with both of them, unless it works out the first time, in which case we don't need to go through the next time. So now we remove satisfied clauses. So this first clause is satisfied, true or B, that's going to be true no matter what B is. The last clause is true for the same reason, so we're just left with the middle two. So that's nice, our number of clauses has shrunk. Check for, what do we check for? Pure symbols first. You could write it in either order. But we check for pure symbols first. B is a pure symbol. So C is not. C, it appears in both positive and, and negative form. But B only appears in the negative form. So we set B to be false. Uh, and there it is, set to false. Remove satisfied clauses. That, uh, that second one was satisfied because not false is true, so that satisfies the disjunction. 
So now we just have one left. Um, C is a pure symbol. It's also a unit clause because the clause has one unresolved literal, but the way I wrote the algorithm, or the way the algorithm's written down, we check for pure symbols first. So C is a pure symbol, so we set it to the right value. False. And now all clauses are satisfied. So we output true. We didn't need to go down this branch. We got lucky. If we evaluated this one first, I think uh, there wasn't a solution, and then we'd have to go back to this one. <coughs> Questions? Yeah? Pure symbol means it always appears in the positive form or it always appears in the negative form. That means it's always negated or it's never negated. Here, so in both of these examples, they were both always negated. So B is always negated. That's the only time it appears. C is always negated. That's the only time it appears. OK, little quiz question. So here, um, you know, there were like partial models going on. We were, we were slowly assigning values to variables. Um, so what is the partial model? that what partial model are we dealing with at this point? And as a reminder, what is a partial model in this context? Who can answer that? Either or both of them. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's right. We've set A to be true. We haven't said anything about B and C yet. So partial model where A is true, and that's it. And in partial model in general, some of the variables are assigned values. Maybe all of them. Another question? B, B is a pure symbol because either every time it appears it has a not in front of it, or every time it appears it doesn't have a not in front of it. It's the first one. Every time it appears it has a not in front of it. So that's one way of being a pure symbol. Every time it appears it has a not in front of it. Uh, yeah, in this line. Where's my cursor? There it is. The other way is if every time it appeared, it didn't have a knot in front of it. Yep. Satisfied clauses, yes. OK. So um, a satisfied clause is uh, true. It's definitely going to be true given the assignments of, variable, assignments of values to variables that you've done so far. So even though you haven't assigned values to all the variables necessarily, You've assigned enough to see that the clause is going to evaluate true. How could it be that you know that in advance? Well, it's ors. We're dealing with ors. So if we have A or B, let's say, OK, you can evaluate this sentence. My name is Michael, or the temperature in New York is 12 degrees, or um, Molly is east of Kenya. Um, it doesn't matter, even if, even if you don't know about the other two things, you know my name is Michael, and so you can know the whole sentence is true. So it's just like that. You, you, if, if any one of the disjuncts, any one of these things in the whole disjunction is true, uh, then, then the whole thing is true. So those are satisfied clauses, and you can get rid of them. OK. Oh, yep. So the reason we set it to false when it's negative and true when it's positive is we want C or not B to be true. How can we make that true? Well, we have a convenient way to make not B true. We can make not B true by making B false. If B is false, then not B is true. We want things to be true if we're looking for an assignment of values to variables that makes the whole sentence true. OK. Let's talk about the efficiency of this. First thing I should say is, in the worst case, it is not efficient. In the worst case, no algorithm is efficient, unless p equals np. Um, in the worst case, this will be exponential in runtime. But for some reason, and I honestly can't really give you very good, a very good account of this, besides the fact that I guess the world is nice. Um, for some reason, it does work pretty efficiently in lots of cases. So a naive implement implementation of DPLL will often solve 
uh, w will often terminate in a reasonable time with, with like 100 variables. Amazing. Um, but there are some extras you can add, extra tricks you can add um, to, to this kind of framework. Um, you can do smart variable, smart variable and value ordering. You can uh, divide and conquer if there are like some sets of variables that never really interact. You can separate them and deal with them separately. You can cache unsolvable subcases as extra clauses to avoid redoing them. So if you've determined that you're going to run into a problem uh, in some setting, but it's like in separate branches of the depth first tree, uh, you can cache that it didn't work over there, so it's definitely not going to work over here. Um, and you can do cool indexing and incremental recomputation tricks so that every step of the DPL algorithm is efficient um, and runs in constant time. Um, you can index clauses where each variable appears. This is what um, we were starting to discuss um, in positive or negative form. You can keep track of the number of satisfied clauses uh, and so on. And real implementations of DPL DPLL solve with hundreds of millions of variables. And uh, if, I, I don't know, I'm amazed by that. I, that's, uh, I, I wouldn't have guessed it. <coughs> Maybe I've done too much theory. <coughs> so SAT solvers used in practice, um, uh, they are used extensively. Um, so they are used for circuit verification. They, they can answer questions like, does this VL VLSI circuit compute the right answer? Uh, they're used for software verification. Does this program uh, do the thing that we were expecting the program to do? Uh, software synthesis, which program per computes the right answer? If you parameterize a program with Boolean variables, you can search for the Boolean variables that that give the program the property you're looking for. Protocol variation, verification, can this security protocol be broken? Protocol synthesis, lots of combinatorial problems where you're looking for a combination of, of uh, variable values that will have some property. Or most importantly, how can Pac-Man eat all the dots? Um, I'm going to talk about, whoa, oh, I really want to talk about this. No, I'll talk about it next time if I have time. This is another algorithm, but uh, we'll skip it for now. Okay, um, so a knowledge-based agent is going to be uh, kind of what you guys are going to uh, build in your project for Pac-Man to use logic to, to deduce how it should behave. And the general structure is this, and this is just so high level, it's amazing that it, that it can work, but you can basically use the rules of logical inference once you format the task appropriately. Once you format the task in propositional logic, um, you can use that to, to do planning. So here's our knowledge-based agent. It, takes, it gets percepts, it returns actions, um, and it has uh, persistently a knowledge base. Uh, it has a T, it, has, it knows what time it is, as, as the variable t. And then we tell the knowledge base, we add to the knowledge base that at time t, it has received the percept called percept. Um, we turn that into some sentence that fits in propositional logic that, that, uh, that talks nicely with its knowledge base. And then we ask it, we ask the knowledge base, um, the, is, act, is this action the right next action? We turn that into a sentence, if we want to know a cer if a certain action is the right answer, we turn that into a sentence, and we ask the knowledge base, is this entailed by your knowledge base? And then we output an action. Uh, and, uh, and then we tell it what it's done. And then we go on to the next time, and we repeat. That's the general structure, but obviously I'm going to need to tell you more. So given a hyper-efficient SAT solver, can we use it to make plans? <clears throat> the answer is yes for the fully observable deterministic case. So last time, maybe you remember we were talking about partially observable Pac-Man. Forget about that for a second. Back to fully observable Pac-Man. That's the setting where we can use a SAT solver to make plans. So yeah, uh, on Tuesday, Pac-Man uh, didn't know uh, exactly where he was. He could just see walls next to him. 
We'll get back to that, but, but for planning, that's, that's not the setting. For planning, um, we, we tell Pac-Man everything, and now it's just searching for a plan. Um, so for t equals 1 to infinity, we initialize the knowledge bay, the, the no, sorry, we start with t equals 1, and then we, we'll do all the next stuff, and then if it doesn't work, we'll go on to um, higher t. So we start with t equals 1, it'll get incremented, and we initialize the knowledge base with pack physics for t time steps, so we tell it how it works, and we just assert that the goal is true at time t. And then we check to see what has to have happened for the goal to be true at time t. What actions must have been taken for that to be true? Is there, is there an assignment of values of, to variables that would make this whole knowledge base true, that would make Pac-Man have achieved the goal in, in t time steps? If no, we increment t, we raise t. So maybe there, maybe there isn't any way that Pac-Man could achieve the goal in one time step. Um, so what about two time steps? What about 10 time steps? Eventually, if the goal is achievable at all, there will be a number of time steps within which it is achievable. And, um, and then, if we have a good SAT solver, we can find the assignment of values to variables that will make everything work properly. That will make that will that will satisfy the fact the, the, the assertion that we've reached the goal at time t. So the planning problem is solvable if and only if there is some satisfying assignment. And the solution is obtained from the truth values of the action variables. If you remember from yesterday, there were there were um, variables in propositional logic corresponding to Pac-Man went north at time five. So we read out what those variables were assigned, and that's our plan. There you go. OK, um, I'll show you some examples in a second. Um, first, here's the basic pack physics for planning. We have the map, where the walls are and aren't, where the food is and isn't. We have the initial state, Pac-Man start location. So we're not making Pac-Man unsure about his start location. We're telling him where he is. Um, we have the initial state, where Pac-Man is, where the ghosts are. We have the actions. We have to say, Pac-Man, you can only do one action at each step. We have the transition model. Um, here now we're adding in food and ghosts. And we have an assertion. This is not really physics, but we have an assertion that the goal is attained by time t. So what must be true? What is the implication of that? What must have happened in the interim? OK. I tried this yesterday. OK. Not yesterday, Tuesday. And it worked then. <sighs> it did. It really did. <sighs> yeah. So that's pretty hard, and it took a lot of steps, and it figured out if I'm going to have gotten to the goal by that time, maybe there were multiple satisfying assignments, but this is one of them. This is a way, this is a sequence of action that incurs by time step whatever, all the food is gone. Here's another one. I think this is so cool. Think for a little bit. I'll talk about that in a second. There. Um, so maybe, um, I, I didn't write the code for this, maybe they skipped t, um, you know, they skipped from t equals 25 to t equals 30 without trying in between, because, you know, there was like, that I think was unnecessary. I could be wrong. I could be uh, second guessing this, and maybe it needed to do that to avoid the ghosts. But I think that was unnecessary, and maybe there was a solution to t equals, for, for t being too less, and it just didn't find it. Um, in any case, it got there in the end. And one more. Super hard one. Lots of ghosts to avoid. This one, I'm not going to second guess it and say that there's a simpler way to do it because I'm not sure there was. There, got it. Um, and this is, I mean, SAT solvers are crazy good. 
and people have put a lot of effort into them. Um, and so we can, if you can convert your problem into a SAT solver, you can take advantage of all these tricks that people have figured out and all the fancy indexing they've done to make it run really fast. Um, if you implemented um, you know, A star search for this, well, I don't know about A star because now you're adding in a heuristic and maybe that would help. But if you implemented uninformed search for this, you might struggle to, to find a solution that there was this many layers deep. Um, because you'd have to add in all those brilliant things people have added to their SAT solvers yourself. All those tricks. Okay. Well, <laughs> while that loads, they don't get to appear nicely. But now a reminder about partially observable Pac-Man, which I talked about last time. Um, there are the, the one basic question that we might ask Pac-Man and partially observable Pac-Man is, where are you? <clears throat> so we have our variables. Here we go. Our wall variables, uh, the blocked variables, whether he's blocked to the north at time five, whether he's blocked to the west at time two, um, which actions he took at which time, where he is at which time. Then we have our sensor model. Um, which says how the sensors relate to the facts about the world. So he's blocked to the west if and only if he's at 1-1 one, one, and there's a wall at 0-1, or he's at 1-2 and there's a wall at 0-2, so on. The map, um, where are the walls? We give, we give, them, we give Pac-Man that, let's say. And the initial state, Pac-Man's definitely somewhere. There's only one action per time step. That's an example of a domain constraint. And the transition model, how the state variables change, or maybe they don't. And from this... Uh, Pac-Man can deduce where he is. So state estimation is just keeping track of what's true now. The logical agent can just ask itself. It can ask whether the knowledge base, plus its actions, plus its percepts, entails that he is at location 2-2 two, two, at time step 6. You just check entailment using the algorithms we discussed. Um, and this is kind of lazy because it looks through its whole life history every time it's trying to figure out where it is. Um, it kind of waits until the very end. So a more eager form of state estimation that would make this more efficient is after every action and percept for every state variable, you check to see whether that state variable is entailed by what you've seen so far. If so, add it to your knowledge base. Or you check to see if it's not entailed. Um, sorry, if it is entailed, if, if the negation is entailed. Um, you check to see if you can definitely show that, uh, that XT is not true. And if so, then you add not XT to your knowledge base. And this is a good idea because, you know, the sort of question you might, it'll be helpful both at time step seven and at time step eight to know where you were at time step six. So you don't have, you won't have to re-deduce um, where you were at time step six. If you deduce it once, you're going to want to add it to your knowledge base. So it's quicker to, to move forward from that in the future. So um, the possible locations then are those that are not tr provably false. Um, and in the last few minutes, I'll run through an example of localization. So here's Pac-Man's percept. What can it deduce about where it is? Well, it's got to be there. Easy. I figured it out on the first go. OK, here's another example. Here's its percept. Where could it be? Could be in any of those places. So everything else has been ruled out and it hasn't been ruled one way or another whether he's in those spots. Okay, then he goes south, and he gets this percept. Still any of those work. Then he goes south, and he gets this percept. Now he's figured out where he is again. Okay, one more example. These are all the possibilities. Everything else has been ruled out. There he is. Took him a little longer. Uh, I don't want to toggle back and forth, sorry. Okay, um, I'll, yeah, I'll get through this slide and then I'll let you go, I'll get through the, the la the, all the rest in the next slide. Is the eager method enough for accurate state estimation? No, sadly. There can be cases where neither XT nor not XT is entailed, and neither yt nor not yt is entailed, but some constraint like 
xt or yt is entailed. So you are going to have to go back to the rest of your knowledge base. Um, for example, let's say there's some study done at time t that purports to, to find that meat causes cancer. Then you, sh you can know either the study at time t was flawed or meat causes cancer. But you're not going to be able to decide either of those questions on its own. So um, exact state estimation is going to be intractable in general. So here's a picture where like these are the actual states that could obtain, but you're dividing up the world into variables into like two into at a much higher level and and you can't necessarily say the exact contours um, concisely. So it requires keeping track of properties of combinations of state variables and that's too hard to do. But it can still help you a bit. So it's not as good as it could be, but it's still a good idea. Okay, I will um, we'll, we'll pick up again on Tuesday and come up if you have questions. <laughs>